Our guest today is Michael Casey. He is one of the most insightful thought leaders in the crypto space. He's published several books, including The Age of Cryptocurrency and The Truth Machine. He writes for The Wall Street Journal, has been a guest on CNBC, and, and is an advisor at Coindesk as well as MIT. How are you today, Michael? I'm fine, thanks, Sean. Yeah, just one very small correction on the bio. I'm no longer at The Wall Street Journal, but Paul Binion, my co-author, is still there. But everything else is, is as stands. I'm at MIT, and I'm an advisor at Coindesk and all that sort of stuff. So thanks for having me on the show. Got it. Yeah, thank you so much, Michael. So my first question um, is, you know, it has to do with one of the things that you said in your YouTube video. So one of your YouTube videos online is uh, Talks by Google, and you mentioned there that uh, disruption is very violent. Many people think that crypto and blockchain the, and the blockchain revolution is indeed very disruptive. And who do you think would be the biggest winners and the biggest losers as cryptocurrencies, commodities, and assets gain more traction, and why? Uh, yeah, very good question. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know how what we what we would, might measure as the biggest. Uh, uh, you know, presumably that would come down to how much money is won or lost. Um, but I do think that the most important form of disruption to focus on um, is that which happens to the accounting profession, um, uh, only because. At the heart of what we're talking about here is a fundamentally different way of going about the process of record keeping. So, you know, record keeping, which is, you know, fundamental to how society actually prepares itself for the, for the process of going about economic exchange, that is, you know, transactions, which are the essence of society and civilization, um, it has for years, as in millennia, uh, been down through centralized entities, there's one person or you know, one company or one institution that maintains the ledger of, of transactions. And then, um, you know, we bring order in as the end if it's a public company. It goes through a periodic review. It, it's typically, you know, uh, there's a quarterly review and then there's an annual report and that sort of thing. Um, and now what we're talking about is one that is uh, you know, decentralized, that is, the ledger doesn't reside in one place, it's maintained collectively by the community, um, and we use a cryptographic system of consensus to update that ledger. So what we end up with is something very, very different, and that is that um, at any given time, there is um, a, a, a sort of a, a robust, resilient consensus around uh, the current state. So we have real-time accounting, effectively. And that means that, um, and, and it's the shared truth that everybody commonly recognizes. So the, the process of, of reconciliation and auditing that is sort of fundamental to um, you know, record keeping, where you've got literally um, you know, millions and millions of accountants around the world who are reconciling their company's ledger against some other company's ledger. Um, and then this quarterly process by which auditors come back and, and you know, check on their work and see that it's accurate and then do it all again at the end of the year. And then we create entire business models around that with, you know, financial analysts and economic analysts all, all working their numbers and, their, and, and gauging their performance against those quarterly benchmarks. Um, and it goes right right through to the government, how we do our economic, you know, assessments, our, our measurements of GDP and inflation and everything else. All of that, in theory, um, could go away. So um, that's what I mean by it being a profound impact on the accounting profession. I think accountants are going to be incredibly important because they're going to have to design the sort of systems of checking and auditing and these sort of smart contract environments that will allow for this process to happen in a more automated way. So I'm not necessarily suggesting that, that the, the ideas behind accounting are going to go away and that jobs will necessarily be lost, but there will be an, a, a, just a profound transformation uh, in, in the way this is all done. Um, certainly, you know, if we can achieve the kind of broad, scalable vision that, that some of us think you know, might emerge out of this. Yes, I think that's a perfect answer. I actually come from an accounting background. I spent uh, uh, some time at Ernst & Young in San Francisco doing uh, transaction advisory services. So uh, a bit similar to what CPAs do, but uh, slightly different um, because it's a blend of consulting and uh, accounting. But excellent points there. I think um, 
you know, the accounting, the accounting industry has changed uh, so much. I, I think one of your other uh, lectures mentioned that accounting started from the Hammurabi Code, um, and then it was further developed by you know Luca Pacioli, and then now it's moving to the blockchain. So I think that's uh, that's pretty cool. I guess looking at the at, at other industries that could potentially be transformed by blockchain. A lot of people cite supply chain management, for example. Um, and I think, as you mentioned before, uh, Walmart was one of the first companies that launched a vendor managed inventory. Can you explain uh -huh. how blockchain adds value in, in this uh, frontier? Yeah, so I think that uh, supply chains you know, represent, in broad strokes, the um, you know, perfect kind of use case for the problem that we're trying to solve with blockchain, which is, after all, uh, a mechanism for getting you know, entities and people who have a common goal uh, but, don't, but who don't necessarily trust each other to find a way to resolve that mistrust of, and, and, and sort of come up with a common record of truth that they can work with and therefore you know, advance their efforts toward this common goal. So the common goal for a, for a supply chain is sell more final goods, right? So everybody in the supply chain producing uh, Apple iPhones is hoping that Apple sells more phones. But each player along the system um, doesn't necessarily trust the other's data because that data will impact um, you know, their capacity to buy, uh, buy low or, or sell high, whatever the case may be on either side of the exchange. So creating a, a system by which certain amounts of information, and we have to be careful about what goes, what gets publicly disclosed and what, what data is useful for the purposes of updating and so there's not competitive advantages that get lost. But that certain data, uh, certainly the, the performance of work processes, uh, the, the, the various kind of uh, uh, transfers, the approval that goods have been shipped, these, are, these can all be automated through the use of sensors and RFID chips and lots of IoT devices that bring automation to the process. Each one of those steps can be recorded in this common ledger so that everybody can see that it has been performed and therefore we can have smart contracts, you know, uh, automatically execute payments um, and so forth. And I think at the end of the day, you know, what we get is much more visibility on where goods are along the chain, uh, where, where the work process is, and hopefully, as a result of that, significantly more efficiency, uh, which means that some players in the system are going to lose, those that have profited from you know, overproducing or over overselling what they do and you know, the benefits that come from waste. Uh, those who benefit from waste will be will lose out because there won't be as much purchasing of whatever materials that are needed. But at the end of the day, the entire system should become more efficient, and we uh, will all benefit from that, uh, both hopefully from the point of view of, of goods being more affordable, uh, but also you know having knowledge of where they're from, and, and most importantly, from an environmental perspective. So I think, yes, there's, there's an enormous amount of disruption. And I think that um, what's important about the supply chain disruption is to get away from the idea that a supply chain itself is something that is uh, is monolithic and is controlled by one entity. So the, the, the Walmart um, vendor uh, inventory management system um, really was Walmart's supply chain. They created they provided the, the information uh, software. They were the ones that sort of dictated the terms of it. And, and so Walmart thinks of the supply chain as its supply chain. But in a, day, in a world of 3D printing and uh, kind of fluid, globalized e-marketplaces uh, with, you know, digital currency that can be automated and so forth, then, you know, the idea of, of being able to onboard very quickly uh, some 3D printing output anywhere in the world to facilitate a new, new you know, order from a customer anywhere and actually have customized products done very quickly uh, means that we have we can start to think of a much more dynamic world the problem is that um, onboarding you know custom uh, suppliers that you don't trust uh, that you've never had a relationship with for is under the current model problematic so I think this is where you get a marriage between 
blockchain technology, IoT, and you know the, the sort of processes like three D printing or additive, additive manufacturing is known because there'll be this capacity to uh, have a provable record of of a particular machine uh, and and its kind of validity, uh, and also the software that is used to print. Uh, particular goods can be run through the same checks and balances. So this is an idea of being able to have a much more dynamic onboarding system, and so a supply chain starts to look far more fluid, right? Far more yes. open. And that's where I think the sort of most uh, dis disruptions actually going to come is that we will start to have, um, you know, a global economy that is is much more on demand. And uh, and customizable in terms of what's what's ordered, and again, I think this is hopefully going to be more efficient. Got it. Yeah, I I, I totally agree with a lot of your points there. Actually, one of uh, the classes that I, that I took before was on something called the beer game, and I believe it was pioneered as well at, in MIT. But um, yeah, 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 I've never played it, but I'm well aware of it. Yes. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Like I think um, it's very simple, but ultimately it shows how in the supply chain management process there's so much. Um, lack of transparency that leads to the bullwhip effect. So suppliers closer to the production line, they see more volatility in their orders, even though demand in the front end might be exactly the same throughout the year. So yeah, hopefully blockchains will enable better ordering and, and better forecasting systems. So another point that I'd like to ask you about is about one of the things you read about Hernando de Soto. He that's about dead capital. And from my understanding, this refers to money that travels in the informal economy. I guess, how do you see the cryptocurrencies and blockchain unlocking capital here? One example is, I think Antonopoulos uh, recently said in one of his lectures that crypto is not, not about providing opportunities for the unbanked. Rather, it's about debanking us all. Is this an exaggeration or what are your thoughts on, on that? Well, I think there's two um, ideas that need to be unpacked in that. Um, so w one is access to payments, um, you know, access to the transactional mechanism. And I, and I agree entirely with Andreas um, that that the goal should not be, um, you know, I think the, the phrase unbanked is problematic because it implies that the solution for everybody is to, is to get everybody a bank account, which means that we all have to onboard into this centralized, um, friction-filled, and, you know, frankly, often very corrupt system uh, to, to enable to sort of to, to have everybody participate in the global economy and, and, and use the payment system that, uh, that we require to do this. Um, but if we just think about the problem as being transactions, and so uh, people who are unbanked, uh, their, their challenge, their problem is not, not having a bank account, but rather that they only way they can transact is through cash and cash is insecure and it means that you can only deal with people in your immediate vicinity and so forth um, then the thing about Bitcoin and, and you know, crypto generally is that it, it, it doesn't require you to get a bank account um, you now but it does give you this sort of global access you can send money anywhere um, and and deal with anybody so it, it, it's a kind of a, you know, as, as people say, it's a digital cash. That's kind of what Satoshi Nakamoto's goal was. So that's, you know, I think absolutely the right way to think about it. Um, you know, I, I, I think it's a long, we have a long way to go before we, you know, disintermediate banks from our system, and we need to go about that in a relatively uh, orderly fashion, um, which will take many, many years and decades, uh, because if we don't, we'll have, you know, a very, very painful uh, transformation. But I do think that that's the end goal, that we need to get to this point where, you know, our, our payment system, at least, um, has nothing to do with banking. There's no reason why banks should be engaged in intermediating our, intermediating our payments. So I agree with him on that. Now, the other is, um, so De Soto's biggest focus really is, is, yes, it's the informal economy, but his point is less about money. Uh, than it is about um, you know assets and and property and uh, and identification and, and how we prove essentially who we are, what we own, and what we've done. And th there's an entire system that that works in the West. You know, your 
property deed, for example, uh, is built upon a system of paper records that has had uh, you know, reliable, for the most part, but that's not always the case even in the West, uh, reliable registries and you know, relatively uncorrupted uh, management. Uh, but even then, we don't trust our, uh, our property titles that much. We still have you know, long title searches that get done every time somebody wants to transfer a property, and there's things like title insurance that is added to any uh, you know, unfinished settled uh, property deal precisely because of the risk that the, t the title actually be, might be wrongly recorded. So this sort of um, failure of our asset registry system, and it's not just property business license, it's, 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 you know, it's other forms of assets, it's, it's equipment, um, it's your motor vehicle, but it can also, if we talk to your personal identity, right? These are all records that are maintained by these centralized entities. Uh, and in much of the world, that record keeping function is completely broken or non-existent, right? So, yes. so there are pe people who therefore are unable to do what the Soto says is the, is the kind of the mechanism by which wealth is created, and that is to take this claim on who we are, on what we own, and transform it into uh, some sort of economic vehicle. So a mortgage is an example of that. And the point is that somebody can own their home in you know, a slum in, uh, in Brazil, but be unable to actually leverage that ownership, because no bank is going to trust the document that's produced in the favela, right? It, yeah. it, it's, you know, so so there's this sort of fundamental mistrust in the record keeping system that becomes a massive barrier for the poor to be able to leverage their assets and turn them into something that they can work with. So, so it just feeds deeply, deeply, deeply into the problem. It, it means that you know businesses can't be created. It means that you know you can't travel because your past you don't have a passport. You don't have you know. There's a whole range of uh, aspects of the, the whole function of proof that uh, is non-existent in these places that absolutely holds these people back. And that's his sort of centralized thesis and one I totally agree with. Can the blockchain help? Um, I think it can. I think that we have the capacity with this technology to, to keep a record so that, you know, if you uh, are in some, some you know, part of the world and, and uh, you know, you think you can just walk behind the counter and get the registrar to scratch out your neighbor's name and put your brother's in there so that the title of the, the, the property is now yours. It can't happen in an immutable ledger, right? This is actually impossible to change it uh, unilaterally. So, so we have this sort of really nice record that can't be broken and I think that's a, that's a very powerful idea and it can help to feed into a much more stable system. The problem we still face is that you know there's this whole garbage in garbage out problem that we talk about a lot within the blockchain world and that is how do you actually still kind of prove that so and so owns this property right there yeah. still needs to be somebody some some authority figure to step in and say yes this is true and this is not. Uh, and that process can be highly politicized or it can be highly corrupted. So, you know, there's, this is not a panacea, but it is uh, certainly a way to think about the record-keeping function in a, in a more uh, robust way. And, and I think it can have positive feedback loops uh, in that, you know, if you can create that, that record for some of it, you start to then build a standard that maybe changes behaviors and helps to improve the whole, you know, attestation process by which you know, uh, identities and houses and, and, you know, assets get defined and, and uh, attributed to people. Indeed, I totally agree with that, the, the thoughtful analysis. The, the, the Wyoming Blockchain Coalition is doing some uh, pretty cool stuff, passing bills on basically registering businesses in a distributed ledger. I think that's pretty cool. Uh, sorry, one last quick question is, you're obviously a, very, uh, a pioneer in, in this space, and I, I think uh, a few years back, you, you talk about how you can develop cross-functional software applications in the blockchain, and it seems like some people are, have already started to work on cross-chain atomic swaps. Can you just tell us a bit about what this means for the industry or certain coins going forward? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, if you think about uh, some of the problems that we've faced, um, and probably the biggest problems that we've faced within the um, whole 
you know, crypto community is the fact that uh, as the business has evolved, we've had to rely on third-party custodians to uh, execute exchanges across chains. And, and by that, I don't just mean um, uh, you know, across blockchains, but also from blockchains into the fiat world, right? So Mt. Gox is an example of a custodian, and of course it got hacked. Um, and uh, I think that if we think about the way that the ICO market exploded out of nowhere last year and um, had all of these potential scams, it, it's partly because we've got no way to you know, trust where our money is going, and there's still a lot of you know uh, exchange that has to go on uh, between you know hard money, let's call it Bitcoin, is relatively hard compared to uh, some of the ICO tokens, um, and, uh, and, and and those tokens. So um, the, the whole custodial uh, centralized exchange model is is this kind of anomaly within a uh, a technology and, and a way of thinking that is supposed to be far more decentralized. So the idea of an atomic swap is kind of exciting because it, it basically says that um, one token that resides in uh, in one chain with its own consensus rules and its own membership and its own uh, you know whole governance structure can be you know automatically swapped with one that comes from another chain so long as there are you know certain properties and standards that they share uh, through a through a variety of, of functionality smart contracts and multi-sig uh, arrangements but there's multi-signature arrangements and so forth uh, and they can basically talk to each other and exchange on their own without there having to be a third party intermediating uh, the idea of the atomic swap is that at no point really does anyone have to hold custody of both uh, instruments uh, because you know any any other exchange now if you think about when you buy a cup of coffee at some point uh, the, the, the barista is holding both the money and the coffee. I mean, you could just literally exchange them one on one, but um, you know, that, that that vision is a useful way to think about the problem of exchange uh, and why you need custodians to sort of be ready to take it in the middle. Um, if you can happen, it can happen atomically. There is no point at which either party has has that level of control, um, and and we can find mathematical ways to do that and sort of like cryptographic forms of escrow rather than uh, ones that require human beings, then then we start to create a, a really interesting framework upon which um, a kind of a multi-token world can emerge. Because if, if at the end of the day, we all have different visions about whether we like this coin or that coin, and we have different reasons to own a particular token associated with a particular function, let's say it's a, you know, a utility token like Filecoin that's focused on uh, you know, storage sharing and so forth, and I want to swap that to something that has to do with you know, some other economic function, then being able to do that without any uh, entity in the middle really opens up possibilities for a more fluid you know, form of what you might say is digital barter in that in that the values of each of these tokens can sort of float against each other rather than having to have uh, a currency like Bitcoin or the dollar or anything be the common unit of account. And then we got then we go down a massive rabbit hole of, of thinking about what money is and whether or not we actually need a central unit of account and whether we could ever divine a system that um, allows for these exchanges to happen automatically uh, without, um, and, you know, with some sort of form of, of, of decentralized price discovery and, and so forth. There's a long way to go in all these things before we uh, can, can sort of establish that kind of weirdly different utopia. Uh, but um, but the point is that, that the framework for that kind of thinking is, is being built and, and these are the technologies that allow it to happen. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Those are, I totally agree with, with all your points. And um, yeah, those are all the questions that I have today. I just wanted to thank you so much, uh, Michael, for your time. Really appreciate you uh, helping helping us out. And, you know, I'm pretty excited to read your book as well with uh, Paul Vigna. Uh, hopefully I'll recommend it to a lot of my friends who are asking me for, for good readings. Okay, please do.